romantic about this motorcycle to me. I don't know what it is. I don't know why it's because it's something I lust lusted after in my youth. I remember it was $3,000, and I was kind of scraping the money together to buy it. I thought it was way too expensive at the time. But you know, it's been worth it. Welcome to the episode of Jay Leno's Garage, the vehicle we're featuring this week, my 1974 Norton John Player Special. This is a motorcycle I've had for, God, over 45 years. I remember when I walked in and bought this thing, it was pretty expensive. It was $3,000 in 1974, which was a lot of money because most Nortons were about 2300 2400 but the John Player was the top of the line. I thought it was the wildest looking motorcycle ever at the time. Uh, back in the 70s, motorcycles were, well, fairing, they did, some did have fairings, but not like this. But John Player was a cigarette brand out of England, much like Marlboro here. They were just starting to ban advertising in television and in films and things like that, but you could still do it in motorsports. So the John Player automobiles and, and the John Player motorcycles like this became became quite popular. I think nowadays people don't even realize it was a cigarette. They think it had something to do with a guy named John Player. It didn't. Peter Williams won all kind of races in these. Now this, truth be told, was just a standard Norton with a fairing on it. There was nothing trick about it, nothing special about it. It was strictly a marketing gimmick, that one that worked. Uh, a lot of people hated the twin headlights. I love the twin headlights because you didn't really see motorcycles with twin headlights other than that Bruce Superior back in 1927, the 680, or maybe the old J.D. Harley from the early 20s. Uh, I thought the twin headlights was kind of cool. It's a classic British twin. Like all motorcycles of the period, this thing vibrated a lot, especially the Atlas. It was just literally, you know, like driving a bass drum, especially the big singles. It was just something you accepted on motorcycles. You know, the, the speedometer attack would do this and the watch hands would fall off your watch. It's just something all motorcycles did, some less than others. But a guy named Bernard Hooper and some other guys at Norton came up with this uh, isolastic, I think that's how they say it, frame. The engine still vibrates, but it's rubber mounted, so it doesn't transfer through to the body and to the handlebars. And it was a revelation. They called it kind of like the feather bed frame and all this kind of stuff. But as long as the rubbers were fairly new, uh, and you change them every five years, maybe 10 years, however long they lasted, it was not vibration free, but certainly better than anything at the time. And this had about, they claimed 60 horsepower. It was, they dined out at about 50 or 51 or 52. It only weighs 435 pounds, which is very light, but this was the fastest thing you could get back in the day. And Norton was a real player in the motorcycle business. All the other English bikes had kind of bitten the dust by 1974. If you got Cycle Magazine or Motorcyclist back in the day, they'd always have the Norton ad with the quote Norton girl, you know, standing in some sort of bikini standing next to the bike. Uh, one of which uh, was Bo Derek, actually, from the famous movie 10. But it, it's classic British motorcycle. I think it's just a real eye turning bike. It's not especially fast anymore, but it's, it's on a twisty road, it's just a wonderful bike to drive. You can lean it in, it's, it's only 435 pounds. And pushing 50 horsepower is not bad. It was considered really fast in its day. Now it'd be equal to probably, geez, a 400 maybe, or maybe a, a 650 even, something like that, one of the modern ones. Has the classic uh, uh, instruments here, these, these Smith instruments, which are, I, I just love. Uh, you had these little winglets here on the, all the switch gear. But this is the original bike. I've done a few things to it, and when you come around the other side, you'll see I, you'll see I put a performance machine disc brake on the front. This bike was built before September 1974. On September 1st, 1974, all motorcycles sold in the United States had to have the gear shift on the left side and the brake on the right side. This is one of the last English ones. Um, they lost a little bit when they had to run the shaft over to the other side. But since September 1st, you couldn't have this. And the thing about riding, I get off one of the other bikes, I'm going along, let me downshift, you know, and I wind up, think I'm downshifting and hitting the brake or vice versa. So it, you have to concentrate. You go, which one is this? Oh yeah, right, the shift's on the right, 
brakes on the left. Kind of a, a trick feature that I, that I put on this, you know, these can dry sump uh, fairly easily. So I put an alarm on it. You hear that? See? Then when you turn the oil on, it cuts the alarm and now the oil can flow through the engine. But this keeps it from sumping all the way and filling up with oil. These are not the standard pipes that were on it. The pipes that are on it were black. I like these pea shooters better. They sound better, they look better, they're lighter. This is not the gas tank, just a fiberglass cover that goes over the gas tank. There's a metal gas tank underneath it that you access through here as you would any normal, or normal uh, motorcycle. Uh, disc brake was a huge deal in 1974. Notice it just has one. Um, I took off the, the uh, I think it was a Lockheed, is that what it was, uh, on here originally, just a big dumb thing, and I put on this performance machine just to make it a bit sharper, uh, added these mirrors here. Uh, what else do we have here? Uh, that's about it. Oh, you know what I did? Uh, because <laughs> these are really uncomfortable if you're over a certain height, we heated the levers and bent them a bit so the shifting was a bit easier. It's kickstart only, no electric start. It, it's so funny when you read uh, the road tests of the period, you know, they call the electric start effete, you know, just like uh, you're not a real man unless you have to kickstart it. Key is down here. Well, let me let me start it up for you, okay? I got it, thank you. There you go, but you know something, as annoying as that alarm is, it saves your life when you're going down the road. Did I turn the, oh, down? and then it seizes and you're screwed. Okay, let's, uh, been riding this bike for a long time. Kind of open the, you know, modern motorcyclists think all this stuff is just the biggest pain in the neck that you could possibly imagine, but then you have to tickle it a little bit. Let me do that. Not too much. Tickler on this side here. That puts, fills the float bowls. And it holds an idle, which not many of them did. I'll put my jacket and helmet on and we'll uh, take it for a ride. You always crush your hands under this fairing. There's something very romantic about this motorcycle to me. I don't know what it is, I don't know why it's because it's something I lust lusted after in my youth. I remember it was $3,000 and I was kind of scraping the money together to buy it. I thought it was way too expensive at the time. But you know, it's been worth it. Oh, it attracts attention. They didn't build a whole lot of these. This was the top of the line for Norton. You know, they made a lot of silly bikes in the 70s. The High Rider, remember that was their chopper. I love the Interstate with the big six gallon tank. Just something sexy about those Smith instruments. I gotta remember <laughs> the shifters on the right side. Oh sure, the Honda 750 was the one to beat in the early 70s, but these still had a bit of life in them. They were still winning races and Isla Mon and Daytona, Peter Williams and all those guys. Peter just passed away earlier this year. Very nice man, I spoke to him a number of times. Quite a history, quite a life. Norton has tried to come back a number of times. Kenny Dreer did it uh, remanufacturing his own and uh, it was not totally successful. Well, the mid-range in this is a lot of fun. Once you get above 55 or 60, then the wind holds you up and it takes all the 
all the strain out of your arms. The older you get, the faster they seem. I think these motors are sweetest in the 700 range. This was taken, I call it an 850, it's 828 cc. It still vibrates, but luckily all the rubber bushings take all that, uh, take it out, doesn't reach it. God, it's hard to believe I had this motorcycle. Well, not quite 50 years, but pretty close to it. The improvements I've made would have made a difference. Uh, as I said, that performance machine uh, just break up front and bending the level, the uh, Kickstarter and the uh, shifter to make it easier. Because if you're six feet tall, this gets a bit cramped. But it's so nice to lean into a corner in this thing. Bullet mirrors on the fairing are kind of fun. It just doesn't look like anything else on the road. Other than touring bikes, you didn't really see a lot of motorcycles in the 70s with these kind of fairings. Maybe the Velocent Thruxton and a few others, but for the most part, not much. But it's torquey. Tires on this thing look so skinny now, but at the time, that was the widest rear tire you could get. I wonder if it looks as good to new motorcycles as it does to us old guys. But you know, when I look at it, I'm not looking at the bike, I'm also looking at the heritage, and thinking all the races I saw at one, and seeing it in magazines, and you wonder how much of that plays a role, because 50 horsepower really isn't much these days. Like to me, some Ferraris from the 1960s are sexier and look better than modern Ferraris. It's the same thing with motorcycles. I mean, it is for me, but I don't know how that is for most people. I had this out on the 210 freeway the other day. I hit a swarm of bees, and I went, oh, that wasn't too bad. And then I felt, ow, one stopped me. Then, ow, that I could just feel them each. And I couldn't take my hands off these bars because they, <laughs> because it's uh, with this fairing, you know, it won't, it won't track unless you hold on to it. It'll start to, start to get a little bit of uh, wobble. You look at this motorcycle and let's realize it's just about dead center in the middle of old motorcycles and new motorcycles. This is the last days of the old school, old technology. You know, Britain, uh, British bikes ruling the, the two world motorcycle world. That was just about over. And the Japanese invasion was about to begin. You went from two cylinders to four cylinders. My God, six cylinder motorcycles. Goose even made a V8. But this is just about the middle point. Everything below this was old and everything above it was new. And uh, this is one of those bikes I'll never sell, you know? It just, because when I can't ride anymore, <laughs> it feels like it's coming up pretty soon. I'm, I'm gonna always wanna look at it. I just think it's one of the most beautiful bikes ever. And it's just sort of at the top of the Norton Feed. This has Amo carburetors on it. And they work quite well. This has been sitting in the back of the motorcycle closet for oh, a few months, hadn't had it out in quite a while. I thought, hey, we should do something on this bike. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I enjoyed taking it out and showing it. Anyway, I'm gonna keep riding and uh, I'll see you guys next week. Thanks for watching. Mm-hmm. <laughs>